Hello everybody. I hope that everyone is doing well. Welcome to the first episode of Wake Up Call. Today on the alarm is the topic of abortion, its morality and its legality. To discuss the topic of abortion today, we have Joshua Deslandes, a proud Christian and a young pro-life advocate. Uh, but before that, we really want to contextualize why abortion is such a hot topic in the world right now. But before that, I think we ought to introduce ourselves, since we haven't thus far. My name is Vishwas Srinivasan, and uh, I'm a second year uh, business and economics student at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Um, I'm originally from a little bit further west in Canada than Montreal. I'm from Winnipeg, Canada. That's where I'm filming it right now. I'm here for the summer. Uh, so yeah, that's me. I'm very excited to be your host for the next little bit. Hi everyone, my name is Milda Gadloskaita. It's so nice to have you watching the show. I am originally born and raised in Lithuania. Um, I'm going to be studying politics, international relations and organizations in Leiden University in The Hague very soon. Uh, some of my favorite things are debating, also just talking about controversial topics. So that's one of the reasons why I'm here today. And it's very nice to have you here. Debating Fishman. is actually yeah. how um, me and Milta met in the first place. Um, we met at the world uh, schools. No, not world schools. World you don't individual, remember how it's called. <laughs> world Individual Debating and Public Speaking Competition. Quite the mouthful. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about why abortion is such a hot topic in the world right now. Vishva, can you tell me a bit about what's going on in the United States? Right, so in America, as uh, many of you may have heard, the landmark decision Roe versus Wade is set to be overturned by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court currently has six conservative justices and three um, liberal justices, and many are citing this as the reason why the court ruling was overturned now at all times. The court balance is ideal for social conservative ca causes. So some of the impacts of this legislation are, I mean, number one, Roe versus Wade, what exactly is it? It was a landmark legal decision that was reached that basically protected a woman's right to abortion without restriction from states. It ruled that a state banning abortion, um, as was common practice before Roe versus Wade, uh, and most likely will, be con will continue to be common practice after Roe v. Wade has, um, has been uh, knocked down, uh, it's ruled that the practice of warning, banning abortions was against the Constitution of the United States. So, basically, um, what happens now with Roe v. Wade is that it allows states, many states, conservative states, have already shown that they're willing to be more and more restrictive on abortion, many states going up to six weeks after pregnancy. But what it does mean is that 13 states immediately after the knocking down of Roe v. Wade, have laws that will make abortion completely illegal again. These are the so-called trigger laws. Laws that have not actually been repealed by the state le legislature, um, but are just not enforced because the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional to enforce them. Uh, so women's rights activists see this as a massive blow for women in America and their right to choose. Thank you, Vishva, for having such a, such a good and kind of simple explaining of such a complex topic. Um, so now I guess I can tell you a bit more about Europe because I feel like the situation here is very different since we have such different countries with different cultures and histories. So to talk about the topic of abortion in Europe, obviously it's also been very relevant in the past days, especially with Poland. I'm sure you've all heard about its um, stricter uh, control of abortion Actually, laws a lot of us, you'd, you'd be surprised months. how clueless North Americans are about European politics. So do you want to explain a little bit more on what's going on in Poland? For sure, yeah, I'd love to do that. Okay, so like uh, talking about the stricter abortion laws in Europe, for example, in Malta, abortion is completely illegal. 
uh, talking about Poland, um, recently there has been like a near total ban. So like right now, abortion in Poland is only legal in cases where it threatens the mother's life or in cases of rape and incest. And also I think that it's really important to notice like that this ban also completely applies to the Ukrainian women refugees who many of them have faced sexual violence and cannot get an abortion in, in, in Poland right now. Also, just this week, Poland's health minister actually signed an order that will oblige all medics to register all pregnancies in Poland. So, but this is not like horrible. This is more like a pressure mechanism, but still like a woman who undergoes an abortion in Poland cannot be punished under the current laws. However, there are certain prison sentences for like up to three years for women who perform an abortion illegally, assist in illegal abortion, or like persuade someone to undergo an abortion. So, yeah, it's pretty wow. scary. So is there, is there any sort of pushback on this? Because in America, and to an extent, even in Canada, we're seeing, I mean, in America, we saw protests outside of Supreme Court justices' houses, tr trying to pressure them to overturn this legal verdict, um, protests in front of state legislatures everywhere, turning them to, trying to tell them to overturn their, their so-called trigger laws and um, protests even at the U.S. Capitol about um, about abortion. This is, this is transcended even into Canada because a lot of women are concerned about, you know, U.S.'s politics potentially coming here. So what's been the response to this um, in Poland or, or Europe? Yeah, for sure. I think that there's also been a lot of uh, uh, criticism, especially after the ban in Poland. I think that is that was when the protests were most active. Uh, I vividly remember a poster some woman made. She wrote, I wish I could abort my government, which was really funny and nice. But yeah, right now I feel like things are dying down a bit, but the topic is still very relevant and I think will come up in the near future anyway. Um, talking about another country where, which is not very democratic, it's been backsliding in the recent years, but there's also a very problematic abortion laws is Hungary. Like, abortion is legal in Hungary, however, I think there's still a lot of uh, these things that, negative things that a woman has to face if she wants to get an abortion. Just sort of barriers, barriers to make it, like, super difficult yeah. for it to happen and making it essentially somewhat of a, of like a, let's call it like a shadow ban or a pseudo, yeah, pseudo ban Yeah, it's such a hassle, abortion. like, there's this kind of mandatory waiting period, you have to go to these councils uh, to get some kind of requirements. You have another like range of barriers, including also the fact that abortion is not covered by any like public uh, healthcare insurance or any subsidization uh, like schemes or and stuff like that. So it's really it's bad for women, especially those who are in poverty. However, there it's, is like, yeah, sure, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah, but these are just some of the worst examples in Europe, I feel like. I do want to have some kind of positivity in here. So I could give the example of Spain, for example. Uh, its Council of Ministers recently approved a draft law that removes the requirement for 16 and 17 year olds to obtain parental consent to terminate a pregnancy. So I know that a lot of young that, girls... I mean, that, that, that makes sense. sense. Like. One of the like main reasons why people get abortions is because they're teens and they need them. It's not their parents' decision, it's your decision. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. I, and, I, and I think that a lot of girls, young girls, they're scared to tell their parents. I mean, having an abortion is something that many women face such backlash uh, uh, because of. So this law is pretty good if it is passed. And also right. if approved, the new law would also like el eliminate this three-day reflection period before getting an abortion <laughs> so yeah so they have a reflection period where like you go to a doctor and you're like hey i want an abortion he's like you know what i want you to think about it as if they haven't been thinking about it already <laughs> i know it's, it's al almost like you they want you to change your mind you know but yeah like, exactly overall getting an abortion already is such like a difficult decision it's not something that you do lightheartedly and I think it's something that puts the woman through so much stress. So she would only do it if she was completely sure about it. Yeah, and I mean, I find all this talk of, of, of this 
sort of authoritarian breach, I mean, what I feel is an authoritarian breach into, you know, your private lives as, as quite alarming for a lot of countries that are considered to be the pillars of democracy and, and freedom of choice and things. Like, look at America. They, they, they talk about how they're the freest and country in the world. They believe in individual rights, individual opinions. I personally believe in all of those things, too. But the thing is, a lot of these laws are, to me, inconsistent with those beliefs. I mean, we're going to hear from two conservative, individual right sort of um, forebears that are also anti-abortion. Um, so I think it will be really interesting to, to hear their perspective and debate their perspective. Um, one criticism that I do have, though, just, just for, for me here in Canada, is is how um, a lot of the U.S.'s rhetoric seems to seep into our politics, both from the left and the right. Like, we're our own country. Canada literally has no laws on abortion whatsoever. It's not protected. It's not threatened. Not a single party leader has ever come out and said, I mean, not, not, not ever, but at least in the most two, recent two elections, they've never said, look, we're going to legislate abortion. In the Conservative Party leadership race, five out of the six candidates have said openly, look, we are pro-choice, we're not going to legislate abortion, this is not on our agenda, we care more about these other issues. And even the one pro-life candidate has never said, we're going to ban abortions altogether. Yeah, I, I love that Like, it's become to the point in Canada where it's not even a thing to debate about. It's just like a, a very normal human right that everyone's supposed to have. But, but the, I mean, one criticism that I have of, of Canadian progressives is that they seem to think that America is Canada, right? America, I mean, Canada has its problems. That's very evident. We are a colonial country. We have a whole history of, of things with that. It's not like, you know, our bed is clean either. But they are acting as if there's some sort of active assault on, on choice in Canada. Trudeau recently put out a big tweet saying that, oh, even while we're watching what's happening in America, we were always committed to protect Canadians against choice. I mean, protects Canadians and a woman's right to choose even when our opponents are aiming to take that away. Like, which opponents are aiming to take that away? Like, th there's not a single major party leader that is planning on introducing legislation of any kind, let alone a complete ban on abortion. Um, so yeah, that, I is, think that, that is something is just, interesting, living next to like, the world's biggest superpower. Yeah, this is like the dirty, the dirty game that is played in politics a lot, and I really hate that. But thanks so much for clarifying that up about Canada, because I feel like especially Europeans uh, tend to merge America and, and, uh, and all of the, the continent into like this one <laughs> huge piece. Oh, so. please don't do that. And please don't treat Canada as if it's like a fundamentally better country than America. I mean, we, we have our problems. We're not some liberal progressive utopia where everyone, you know, is free and, and, and whatnot. We have, we have our problems, but they're distinct from those of America. I don't think that importing American culture war topics does much good when we have our own culture war topics right here. Yeah, for sure. Amazing topic. And I'm sure that we can discuss uh, some of those issues in later episodes. Uh, but for now, I think... Right, and I'm sure that... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, but for now, I think in order to get more perspectives and to discuss abortion and, and to have guests that disagree with us, it would be very good to, to invite our guests to speak. All right, we're very happy to have on the show with us Joshua Deslandes. He is a proud Christian conservative and Canadian and a current student at the University of Toronto. He is studying political science and economics. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show, Joshua. Thank you. All right, so um, Josh, I mean, for starters, let's, um, let's hear your general stance. Like, what is your view on abortion, on its morality and its legality? Yeah, so I am pro-life, very pro-life. I think that Abortion is wrong in all um, cases. Um, I think that we should have at least some restrictions in this country to start um, to really 
get the ball moving on abortion because for the last 50 years, we just kind of ignored it and just, you know, haven't said anything on it. So I think we should start to really talk about it and have some restrictions against it. So even in the cases of like rape or sexual assault, you think when the woman didn't have a choice, abortions should still be banned in this case? Yeah. So I know obviously it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question, but I do not think that in those cases, the answer should just be to kill the the baby. Um, I don't think that death is is, is um, going to be moral in any sense. And so I think that that is the, the, that's the, um, the, the kind of the, uh, the take I will I will have, but it is a, it is it is a difficult subject to really talk about and to you know talk about the actual um, legality of it and everything else about it. But that is my take. So so for you, what is the principal guiding reason why um, why you believe it is wrong? I mean, you said you feel it's morally wrong, uh, and do you feel that that morality is informed by your religion? Is it informed by your sense of of what is a life and and where do you draw the distinction between the morality of something and the government's uh, ability to regulate it? Yeah, so it's a great question. I think, first of all, um, because I'm a Christian, um, it has it spawned from a lot of my Christian beliefs. You know, obviously the murder is wrong. Um, the, kill, the Obviously um, unborn baby shouldn't be killed in any circumstance. And so I just believe that in that sense, um, we shouldn't be killing babies at all. Um, now, in the terms of government and um, different areas of uh, that, I think I think that it's really important that conservatives need to obviously talk about you know small government and big government, but at the same the same at the same time talk about how abortion is what's killing unborn babies, and we have to talk about that you know um, basically talking about how we can start to regulate. And I'm not saying we have to ban abortion on demand because right. it's a big, big step. But I'm saying at least get the ball rolling. You know, 84% of Canadians agree that same-sex, um, not, not same-sex, I'm oh, sorry, uh, that sex-selective abortion is wrong. Or 84% of Canadians, a large amount of Canadians agree with that. I've talked to liberals, um, even socialists who, who agree with this stance, right? And so I would say to, to them at least, let's try to get the ball moving on this. You know, I want to talk to people about how we can get the ball moving, how we can uh, come together and agree on these things. And so at least let's start with from, from that very premise that we can get the ball moving. I know liberals who want restrictions, um, late-term abortion restrictions or other restrictions uh, concerning same, obviously site selective, but there's other, other restrictions that they want, to, they want to have too. And they talk to me about it all the time. So, yeah. So sort of to, yeah. to you know what, Milda, go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, it's good. Uh, you thought, you talked about, like uh, getting the ball rolling and that is something that I will definitely talk about and expand about like what do conservatives want to do when kind of introducing the ban but uh, I also wanted to ask you like I know that a lot of uh, religious people base their views on abortion um, on their religion right but uh, then what do you think like what kind of right does the government have to instill one moral value of like a single religion on all citizens who are atheists or or don't believe in that specific uh, belief? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that, you know, when it comes to government, obviously, um, people want to talk about the separation of church and state. But the thing is, is that when you have to talk about the separation of church and state, there are some things that are just moral. I have atheist friends who also want to restrict abortion, even much like they always want to, want to, want to restrict abortion. And so, you know, obviously, I don't think it's just a Christian argument for doing this. I have a Christian argument for doing it. There's other atheist arguments for doing it. Uh, I'm not entirely versed in all the so atheist arguments. So what would be, what would be but... an example of, of, of an atheist's uh, argument against, like you say it's, it's just a moral cause. It's not necessarily exclusively a Christian cause. What would you say is, is, is an example of the way that, for, what, what's a secular argument that you would make as to why um, a fetus is a baby and why abortion ought to be illegal. Because well, in reality, it's the, 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 the secular nature of these, of morality is what governs Western democracies. Yeah, so I think that, you know, I'm not entirely well versed on the atheist argument for um, 
um, restricting abortion, but I will say that the one I've heard the most is that um, 96% of science, 96% of scientists or biologists believe that um, a human life starts at conception. And so from there, um, that already basically invalidates every um, argument for abortion. But that's Do really you know just where that what number I hear. comes from? I'm not exactly remember, I can't remember it right now, but right. I remember I was hearing that a lot. And so I think that's one of the arguments there, but I'm not entirely well versed on the atheist arguments. I really um, understand the, the people of faith and how they, um, you know, believe on these issues. So, so uh, what do we also wanted to really talk about? Um, if uh, let's say Canada would uh, one day or, or the United States or any other country, uh, propose an abortion ban or, or actually execute it. Uh, what do then conservatives propose, let's say, instead of an, an abortion? Like, do you propose abstinence? Do you propose more sex education, let's say, free condoms? What is the argument there? Yeah, so I think the, the first thing we have to do before we do anything about abortion is fund pregnancy centers. I think that's one thing that I would love to do first, right? I think the government gives a lot of a lot of money to overseas um, abortions and they fund a lot of other projects. So I think we can fund pregnancy centers and fund them well, right? I think we can fund these things. And so when we actually do start to restrict abortion, they don't have to talk about how, oh, well, the government hasn't done this, the government hasn't done that. Well, actually we have. And so you can use these subsidies um, these uh, services. And obviously, uh, I think a lot of programs could be added to um, actually help this um, flourish. I don't think we should be leaving Canadians on the dark like that. That's not that's not a that's not a Canadian thing to do, um, especially with the culture being so pro-abortion. Um, it, it takes a lot of baby steps to really get this done. So, so to clarify, you do support giving significant additional supports um, to women during their pregnancy and also with help raising a child. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So you would also support increased funding to like foster care services, 100%. Um, adoption services, things like 100%. that as, as alternatives to, um, to abortion. 100%. I think that's very, very important. All right. So my question for you is, is, is coming back to this, is, this question of, of choice, right? Let's say that a mother is in danger. Her life is in danger. It could be a teenager that was raped by an older relative. It could be someone that's just physically not capable of of having a baby. How do you how do you deal with that? The fact that it might be dangerous to their health to even carry the pregnancy out to term. Yeah, so that's also one of the other rare and um, moments of you know pregnancy. Obviously, I think the rape and the and the mother's health obviously is a topic to talk about, but. At the same time, when you think about it objectively, it's a very, very small percentage. A lot of this does come, um, you know, with just casual hookups and casual sets like that. But obviously, it is it is a important topic, and I think that in that terms, um, there is to be a conversation had. Um, now, for me, in my case, I still wouldn't want um, the baby to to um, be killed because it is a human life. And so I think we should treat it like a human life. Obviously, whenever, um, you know, obviously whenever uh, someone shoots a pregnant person or someone kills a pregnant person, this is double homicide because there are two people involved. And so is I don't it, think- Is it should... considered a double homicide? Well, people, people always Legally? say, you know, well, I'm not sure exactly in Canada, but when people, people do say that it is the, considered a double homicide to kill a pregnant person at least. I mean, uh... I, I would argue that of, of of course it's 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 a tragedy when when anyone dies, especially you know a pregnant person. For but sure. Is there? Do you really believe that an unborn fetus of what a couple weeks, six weeks, ten weeks, is of equal worth as a full grown adult human? Maybe not even an adult human. Maybe a child that was sexually assaulted. Do you think that they are they should be given equal? treatment or honestly in your case saying that abortion should be illegal for even if it's endangering the mother's life do you think that they should be given higher treatment than a living breathing person that is sentient well in the same sense the same um, sense of sentient well we can make the same argument with someone who um, is in a coma someone who has who has no power over what's going on over them right and so i think that the same the same saying you can the same um, sentence you can't be 
saying that, well, we can't treat somebody who's in a coma um, in a different way. So in the same vein, I would say that you have to treat this, the, un, the unborn fetus, the, the unborn baby, as a baby, as a human living organism. But the thing is that when someone does not have sentience, let's say someone is brain dead, the option is given to their close family fa members to sort of pull the plug and end life support. Yeah, and I, I still um, disagree with that. So I think in the same vein, you have to talk about, you know, the baby being a baby. It's, a, it's, a, it's still a human, um, it's, it's still a living, breathing thing, right? It's and not so breathing, obviously, though. And it's, it's not living in any capacity that we would consider living. Well, human life starts at conception. 96% 90, of doctors agree with that. And so that's a scientific argument. I would say that, you know, um, we have to talk about how it's still a living organism. Okay, um, but getting back a bit to the topic of government regulation and, and how much power does the government or should it have on citizens, I think conservatives overall really value individual freedom and, and the, the liberty to do whatever you want with your life. So like, let's see, I don't know, do you support mandatory vaccinations? Yeah, so when conservatives always talk about, you know, yeah, we have to uh, have individual freedoms and freedom and freedom, 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 right? But the same thing, at the same time, we've talked about this, it's something called hedonism. Hedonism is what um, is a bad thing, right? And so obviously, I don't support mandatory va vaccinations at all. I think that that's um, an encroachment of uh, charter rights and freedoms. But at the same time, we have to understand that killing and murder is not the same thing as vaccine mandates. It's two different things. Okay, um, but I would like to contest that a bit. I think um, we as humans, we kill so much, but we care so much about like the perceptions of, of, of objects. Like we kill animals every single day and that's morally okay for us. Um, and what a lot of other conservatives say, let's say, is that it's okay to abort a baby when it's very, like, very, very, very little, but it's bad when it's, you know, like, eight months old. So once again, I just, I do think that there's some kind of hypocrisy between uh, saying that the government is okay, that 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 is like killing a baby or killing okay. a person. Yeah. So in that same in that same sentence, you know, obviously, I'd actually agree with you. I wouldn't say that. Um, I would never want to say that, well, it's okay to kill a baby when it's, um, when it's very, very little, but then it's okay. It's not okay when it's nine months nine, or nine or eight months. That's hypocrisy. I would agree. I would say be consistent. You cannot say to people that, oh, I don't believe, um, you know, you can kill a baby when it's uh, nine months, but if it's, all, if it's very little, then hey, it's whatever. No, I, obviously, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. Okay, you know what, I, I think that uh, the three of us just have fundamentally different misconceptions, I mean, understandings of of where the, the human life starts. So I think we can leave the morality argument aside uh, for a second. Uh, let's talk about practicality. Josh, I'm with you here. I don't really like abortions. They make me feel uncomfortable. I do think that, you know, a fetus, while I don't consider it to be equivalent to a human, is still, to me, something significant it's not insignificant and i think that most people feel that way they feel that um a fetus is a lot more than nothing but not quite a human and sometimes the human's needs needs the adult human's needs needs to come and the mother's needs specifically need to come first um my question for you is um whether legislation actually serves your end goal um statistics from um the guttmacher institute show that countries with more restrictive abortion laws, um, which generally tend to be uh, countries that are lesser developed and uh, less liberal, they also, they found that those countries actually have higher rates of abortion because abortion rates are not based on the legality and the supply of legal abortions, but rather the demand of abortions by mothers. So what this leads to, these higher abortions in countries where it's illegal, and, and the fact that that demand is always going to exist is a lot of backroom abortions that happen with coat hangers and things like that that are unsafe and end up often 
killing both the fetus and uh, the mother. Um, given this, do you find that um, your position on abortion is still defensible? Yeah, I think it is. So in that term, you know, I've always I've always hear, well, then your legislation won't actually do anything because higher rates of abortion is always is already um, in countries where they have where it's legal. Right. And so they always make this argument. But I think we I think the thing is we have to break down is that obviously I think a culture of life needs to be um, really implemented here. Right. I think that in Canada, we have this culture of, of death, we have, we say, oh, you know, it's okay for euthanasia, for maid, for abortion. I think those, those are like culture of death things, right? I think if you, start, if you started promoting life, starting promoting things like, you know, palliative care and and uh, pregnancy centers and, you know, um, things like the programs that really support uh, pregnancies and, you know, even for me, pro-family bills, right? Things like um, giving tax breaks to people with more kids and like, you know, more life build. I think we cannot really, um, cut out a lot of the uh, abortion that w that would happen all right so what would your proposed solution for i mean rather punishment for violating an illegal abortion lobby would it be towards a doctor or towards the woman herself yeah so i think it'd be towards a doctor i would not i would not criminalize the woman because i think the doctor would have to be more accountable for actually doing the thing than the woman. Um, but yeah, so I'd criminalize the doctor. Um, Criminal Code of Canada would probably, eh, I'd probably give them five to 10, five to 10 years. Five so, to 10 years in prison if found guilty of performing yes. an abortion? Okay. Yes. Yeah, and so I think with that, that would actually start the ball rolling. And, they, and it's, for me, obviously, I'm not going to go full out and ban abortion because it's not, it's not going to happen. <laughs> So I would probably start with a collective abortion, which most Canadians agree with, and then we get the ball rolling from there. Okay, I also wanted to talk a bit more about like the woman's perspective, since I'm the only woman here. Um, I don't know any actually woman uh, in my at least community who are pro-life and, and who support the ban of abortions. I'm I sure that one, you- I know one, Josh, I know one. <laughs> I know that you might have these kind of women in your life. Uh, but just talking about like passing, let's say, a law on abortion, would and should women get more say in it, even though both parents obviously, uh, you know, are responsible for the child? But I think the, the fact that the woman carries the baby for nine months and then has to deal with the physical and mental consequences of that birth is a significant decision maker and like effect on 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 her power to make that decision what, what what would you say about that yeah it's a great question i think that you know obviously for me we're all I think we're all different we have friends who are pro-choice who are pro-life i have a good several friends who are women who are pro-life um a lot actually i went to the march for life um event in ottawa and there were a lot of women and i think actually statistically a lot of women actually do make up the pro-life movement but aside from that, if you want to go back to, you know, the whole argument that, well, you don't have a uterus, so you can't talk about anything. Well, in the same vein, um, 1973, when they legalized um, abortion in America, it was five white men who actually talked about, or not even talked about, but actually voted to um, uh, legalize abortion. And so I think that argument falls apart right there, because if you're going to say that, well, then they shouldn't have a say and, um, either, right? And so... In that vein, obviously, I think that it's a 50, 50, 50, 50, sorry, a position of, um, you know, have to actually have this conversation because obviously there's a man and there's a woman. And so when they procreate, it's a 50, 50 thing. Obviously, there's no, um, there's no sperm. If the sperm didn't go into egg, well, then it doesn't happen. Right. And so I think it's a 50, 50 conversation there. But don't you think it's more the woman's responsibility bearing a child right the woman is stuck with it the pregnancy the man can run away i i'm not advocating not saying that's a good thing but it's something that happens all the time no matter what happens the woman is forced to carry through the pregnancy even though the man has other options therefore don't you think the woman should have slightly more of a voice than the man yeah so obviously in that in that same vein i would say you know i think we should be advocating for men to be men again um, to actually stand up and, you know, try to be the father that, um, you know, that they're supposed to be. 
um, and in the black community, I think, you know, it's, it's a really problem with fatherlessness and it creates a lot of problems for the black community, as you see, you know, rising crime, um, different um, rates of going to prison for black men, especially. Um, right. And so I think if even the, the race car, <laughs> that would be a big factor. But I think that if you, you know, if you want to talk about that, I would still say it's a 50, 50 um, percent because as a, again, the egg, the, the sperm doesn't happen or without anything happening. You have to have both perspectives, right? And obviously I understand that the woman's carrying the, ter the baby to term. I understand this, but at the same time, um, yes, it's, it can, it can be her choice, but I think the man should have a say in this as well. All right. So, um, it seems like a lot of your conditional qualifiers for, okay, if this happened, then I would support a full ban on abortion are things that take a long time to complete. You're talking about broader cultural transitions. You're saying, look, um, in my opinion, men are not fulfilling their duties. I want a culture to get them to refulfill their duties. I don't think that we're investing in, enough in pregnancy care. These are all like very, we need to build up another phrase that you said was building up a culture of life instead of a culture of death. And I mean, I agree with all of these things um, on, on the principle standpoint. I think it's important for, for men to be responsible and to, to be caregivers in their own right. That responsibility should not fall upon the woman. But what do you do in the interim when none of these things are implemented right now? Let's say you go tomorrow, let's say you go one year from now and you ban abortion. What is it, what is the timeline is really is really my question for you to get um, to a complete ban on abortion. Yeah, so I think the timeline it's a funny timeline, but I think one thing that I would start obviously is sex selective abortion. Um, from there, um, you have to see how the conservative party actually wants to start to view abortion because obviously right now the party will not open any issues about abortion. The parliament won't open the issue again, so we have to wait for that. And I, so I think the time that would be 10 to 20 years, I'm, to be honest, and that's still a, a really like a rough estimate, ballpark estimate. This might not even happen in my lifetime. But for me, I, would, I really won't, wouldn't care if it happened in my lifetime. It's, 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 if I know, at least, if I can get the ball moving from where I am right now, if I, could, if I, if I can make a difference and you know, legislators um, way past me to ban abortion when, even when I'm gone, well then, hey, I'm I'm okay. I'm 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 okay, right? And so I think that I can't really give you a timeline, but if I could maybe 10 to 20 years if we can even form government again. Um and if if we do, then we can start get the ball rolling on these issues. Your stance is pretty clear to me. Like I I really I really enjoy and um and definitely support the fact that you are very clear in your stance and you're not a hypocrite so uh, good job yeah, on that no one could call you no one could call you a hypocrite josh um <laughs> thank you yeah and we'd like to thank you uh so much for coming on the show for uh, sure being so open about your views um and um you know sort of providing a new perspective other than our two variations on pro-choice for sure. And I was, I will say that, you know, I think a lot of conservatives need to start being more, yes, I believe this and I'm not, I'm not going to move on my issue. Right. Because I right. think when we, whenever we um, say, you know what, well, I'll give room to that. Mm, I'll give room to this. It creates kind of a space of a kind of a gray space. And so it gives a chance for people to say, well, there's a flaw in your argument there because of this, and you didn't say this before, prior, right? And so I think it's a more um, appropriate stance to just have a stance and stay with that stance. And even if it's, um, even if, you know, you feel like you can't defend it, you better find a way to defend it because that's your stance. Yeah, exactly. That's your stance. And, and I appreciate that yours isn't defined by what's popular or what's trendy. It's defined by what your values are. For sure. All right. Um, I think that wraps it up. Uh, thank you so much again for uh, coming on the show and maybe we'll have you on soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.
So for the last part of this episode, we want to introduce you to what we call the rant, where both me and Vishwa have our rants about anything that we want to talk about that day. So today I wanted to talk about something that is quite related to the topic of abortion, however, not quite so. So this is a, something that I've become extremely passionate about about like a year ago after reading a book called Regretting Motherhood. It, that is a study done by Orna Doneth and it really opened up my mind onto the way that I look at mothers and like motherhood overall as an experience. So I just want to share some of those thoughts and some of the quotes from the book today. But I think that like generally overall after having the discussion today, I understood that our inability to accept abortions as like a legit human right or a legit medical procedure also very much feeds into the idea that being a mother is some kind of role that nobody could ever want to decline to have. That, is a, that it is a sacred role that should be always accepted and always wanted. So that also really, really feeds into that idea that we shouldn't ban abortions. But let's take it kind of a step back and explain how, why, and, and, and why women have to become mothers by the popular belief. So I think what the author really wants to say that the idea that women have some kind of natural and normal life trajectory does draw some of its power from like the cultural idea of biological determinism, which naturally leads to motherhood. I think it also heavily re relies on this like heteronormative logic that is instilled in both when, both the, like women and men that life is some kind of series of progressive events. You know, you you have some kind of roadmap. You you are you come into this world. You go to school. You go to work. You get married, and then you become a parent, which is essentially flawed. And I think a lot of people are changing this kind of. Uh, trajectory over time, but there's still a lot of pressure to follow it. So what I hear a lot of people, especially in the West saying right now, is that women are becoming um, more free to choose their life path and that they don't have to be mothers if they don't want to. But I think the concept of free choice is quite different. And the author of the book, Orna, uh, really beautifully illustrates this. She says that the concept of free choice necessarily must re include ref reflections about that choice's costs, benefits, and consequences, as well as the existence of other options that will not be followed by sanctions and punishments. And I think that even I, an extremely privileged woman, if I, if I chose not to be a mother, I would still very much experience these punishments. Uh, I would still experience scrutiny from my community, weird looks from my family members and stuff like that. So essentially, it's not a free choice, because if it was, I wouldn't be followed by these sanctions. And I think that a lot of women around the world, whether in the North or in the South, they, they choose not to exercise their free choice because they know that it will be judged so much and they will experience so many hurdles. But generally what the book is about mostly is that like regretting motherhood sheds our inability that to treat motherhood as like one among many human relationships rather than some kind of sacred and mythological role. And there's a certain duality in how we perceive mothers overall. I think that in one way we see them as sacred and we like respect them and love them no matter what. But there is also the part where a woman loses worth if she does not become a mother. And also that side of the story where moms are seen as so patient, so loving and so caring for like to the extent of any cost, to the extent where they should care for their children and the father unconditionally. And this often, I think, in many households, leads to the mothers being disrespected and kind of treated as, you know, they should be the ones taking care of everything because being a mother is the most important role that a woman can have. So in this sense, the regret of motherhood may help to refute the notion that mothers are objects whose aim is to constantly like serve others and to link their own well-being to the well-being of their children and to instead acknowledge mothers as subjects who are owners of their own bodies, their own thoughts, emotions, imagination and memories and who are like capable of evaluating the whole experience of motherhood and to weigh if it was worthwhile or not. But now I want to make the most important distinction about the global South, because what we don't think about as uh, as Westerners 
is how motherhood is a legitimate way for women to kind of rebirth themselves into a new world, like to save themselves from poverty, from abuse, racism, homophobia, sexual violence, prostitution, homelessness, imprisonment, and stuff like that. For example, teenagers might get married because they, or, or be young mothers because they want to attain a sense of liberty that was not really found in their parents' house. And women with mental disabilities might become married in order to like free themselves from this huge stigma that they have felt their entire lives. But for many of, of, of women, the transition into motherhood is kind of like crossing a bridge, you know? On the other side, they hope to find a community that now accepts them, that did not accept them uh, before they became mothers. And this especially reminds me of, let's say, the uh, India's dowry system. If you don't know what it is, um, it's actually illegal in India, but it still happens very frequently in um, rural areas, as I've heard. Uh, and I think that in this case, the woman basically is sold to the man's family as like a baby maker and a wife. And the woman's family gets quite a big financial sum of money and they can legitimately like raise their living conditions and kind of help themselves in this way. So once again, I think this really feeds into you know, objectifying women and kind of making them into baby maker machines, mothers and nothing else. Um, but this happens a lot in the global South, but I think uh, also in the, in the Western world, we have this kind of generalization of non-mothers to be cold hearted women or like women who, which hate children or who are bad mothers. However, I think that that, that is absolutely like not the case. What I read a lot about in the book is how even the mothers who very much regret motherhood as an experience, they still absolutely love their children. They still care for their children. There are other women who say that they regret motherhood and they would rather not have those children. However, they're still very responsible human beings and you know they've taken up the responsibility to care for them. The same way I think it like uh, applies to relationships, let's say. Like if you've had a horrible relationship or a horrible breakup, you might regret that relationship very much, but you still can wish the best for your ex and like love them very much for the rest of your life, right? So that's, I think, a generalization that has to fall on non-mothers. And the same idea I think happens uh, with non-parents. I think non-parents, especially in movies and like pop culture, are painted as some kind of CEOs that are like very career focused or very pleasure focused hedonists, which like feeds into the idea that everyone is just dying to become a parent and everyone wants to have children, uh, but there are some kind of outside forces stopping them. However, that is not always the case. And it's also like a huge stereotype. Uh, Orna tells that she, she reads a lot of non-parent discussions and like blogs on the internet. And she says that the relevant topics there are like music, philosophy, and volunteering, not uh, work and children. So the moral of the story, I guess, in this monologue, if there is any, is to accept that being a mother is not the choice for every woman and that women should not be generalized and put into frames of how they should act. They're a separate entity uh, uh, women are a separate entity and they shouldn't be necessarily, their identity shouldn't be tied to being a mother or becoming one. Um, and yeah, and, and think more broadly about this topic and, and subject in, in the world. So that's it for me. <laughs> that was just a f fascinating monologue, uh, Milda. I really felt that, you know, that is something that a university feminist theory professor would be very proud of. Um, so, you know, in, in my listening to that, I, th I thought it was really interesting how you exposed the, the dichotomy of, of mothers being seen as this central and important role, yet them not getting the respect in society, uh, that they deserve. Um, so my question for you is sort of just to, to, to push back a little bit is, do you think that, that a recalibration of society that surrounds, you know, like motherhood as like, sees motherhood as less important and less central. Do you think that that may lead to mothers being appreciated like even less? Do you think that that runs contrary to the attitude of, um, of 
society not like properly valuing the work that people do at home and seeing raising children as an actual legitimate way to live your life? Yeah, that's a great question, I think. And that's definitely uh, s some thoughts that should be considered. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that making motherhood not as sacred would be the best alternative. I think the best alternative would be to see mothers as people who, like how the author says, to treat motherhood as one among many human relationships. Right. That m mothers can still get very mad, they still can get insulted, and they can push back on their children. They don't have to always right. be patient and always be caring and, and stuff like that. I think that would be the best way to handle the situation. So, like, recalibrating the idea as, I am so-and-so, I am first and foremost a mother. It's instead yeah. of, sort of sort of saying that, like, okay, I'm this person, I'm a mom, I do this, I do that. I have a whole personality not attached to uh, my children. Is that sort of yeah, for sure. sort of the the recalibration that you that you wish to see? Yeah, I think I mean I think that would be a lot better in society. However, I do definitely see many women who do treat motherhood as the biggest personality trait that they yeah. have, and that love their children so much that they. That all they want to do is be mothers, and I'm not in any way critiquing these women at all. Right, that's, that's fine, as long as they have a legitimate choice to that, and it's yeah. not societal pressures or family pressures or things like that getting to them. Yeah, for sure, and, and I think that the only way we can understand if we have free choice is to, first of all, break these societal-like pressures and to think with a clear mind um, in the yeah. future. So, Vishva, what are you ranting about this week? Tell me. Today, I'm taking a look at my home country of Canada. As many of you are aware, earlier this year, a convoy of truckers descended upon the nation's capital of Ottawa in protest of the federal government's vaccine mandates and other COVID restrictions. These protesters blocked off significant portions of downtown Ottawa and several border crossings. In response to these protests, the Trudeau government invoked the Emergencies Act, Canada's most powerful civilian law. That gives the government the sweeping powers, such as the ability to freeze assets without a court warrant. I'm not interested in talking about the protests, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing for Canada, or even whether the use of the Emergencies Act was justified or not. Today, what I want to talk about is the inquiry into the federal government's handling of the situation and the lies that were told during it, and the potential lessons that we can learn about the government's misleading testimony. In justifying his use of the act to Parliament, Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino said, and I'm quoting, at the recommendation of police, we invoked the Emergencies Act to protect Canadians. This wasn't just a one-off line. In fact, in his testimony on April 26, Ms. Minister Mendicino said again, and I'm quoting again, we invoked the act because it was the advice of non-partisan law enforcement. Surely, if a cabinet minister says something to parliament, it must be true, right? This was reported in the media as a fact for weeks. No one ever bothered to scrutinize Mendicino's words and confirm whether they were true or not. Well, surprise, surprise, politicians lie. And it turns out that Mendicino was telling an absolute bald-faced lie when he said that the police asked for the Emergencies Act. Ottawa Police Service's interim chief said that the force made no request for the federal government to invoke the Emergencies Act. Ditto the commissioner of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or the RCMP. This is Canada's national police force. Yet, this is at odds with what Mendicino said in his testimony, where he specifically said, and once again, I'm using his own words. As we took our decision in what we could do to respond, we were following the advice of non-partisan law enforcement. We were following the advice of various levels of law enforcement, including the RCMP. There we have it. It doesn't get much clearer than that, folks. Mendicino told a lie. Of course, Mendicino is trying to deflect from this. He denies it, and he says... Oh, I've deliberately been misinterpreted. 
This is an orchestrated campaign of misinformation. What I meant to say is that the police requested some of the powers that are contained within the Emergencies Act. To this, I say two things. Number one, prove it. For a decision this important, you should have some documentation of the police requesting you for the powers used in the Emergencies Act. Secondly, I just want to point out that this is not what Mr. Mandicino said. He said that they requested to invoke the act, specifically on multiple occasions. What Mendicino did was he got caught lying and he expected that the Canadian public would not scrutinize his word. Thankfully, we at least have some folks in the media that are looking back on this. Now you might be asking me, Vishwa, I get it. Politicians lie. This is nothing new, dude. Why should I care about it this time? That's a perfectly valid question. But here's why I think that Mendicino's lies are important and deserve more attention. Firstly, it is the power of the act and the legal threshold required to justify it. Secondly, I believe that it serves as an example of why the government should never be in charge of regulating misinformation. On to the first point, the power of the act and the threshold required to justify it. Given that this is Canada's most powerful law and the sweeping power that it grants the government, remember, they can literally freeze your assets if you're suspected of even donating to the convoy, and this is without a court warrant. Because of this, the law specifies that in order to invoke the Emergencies Act and justify its use, the government must exceed a high burden of proof to justify its invocation. The burden of proof is as follows. It is not sufficient to prove that the act was useful. It is not sufficient to prove that the act was helpful, handy, or even that it contributed to solving the problem. No. They need to prove that this act was the only way that this crisis could have been stopped. And in doing so, they are using a lie to justify their invocation of this act. If the Emergencies Act was truly necessary, why resort to lies to justify it? They froze the bank accounts of protesters and are using a false premise to justify that. This is a terrible precedent for the country and a threat to Canadian democracy. Second reason is the more broader topic of, inf of misinformation. This is a broader case for why governments should never be in charge of regulating it it's because they are constantly guilty of spreading it. Bush did it with the Iraq war, Trump did it with the 2020 election, and Trudeau's government and Marco Mendicino are doing it right now. Governments lie all the time, and they expect us to believe them. This government especially is keen on cracking down on what they call as dangerous misinformation and are planning on introducing a suite of bills to combat it, especially in the online sphere. Thankfully, we currently have methods to fact check our governments and hold their feet to the fire when they themselves are guilty of spreading misinformation. After lying to our faces about one of the most pivotal moments in modern Canadian political history, do you really trust the government to regulate the truth? I personally don't. The moral of the story is this. Governments lie. They lie a lot, and they lie about important things. You should never trust a liar with telling you what the truth is. Thank you so much, Vishwa. I, I love seeing how passionate you are about this, because I am too. Like, governments lie, and we should always hold them up to scrutiny and, like, definitely critique them and just hold them to account. So um, one thing that I really wanted to ask you and what you brought up already, that this is a threat to democracy. Um, so what do you think are the, like, the further implications of this? Like, is the Emergencies Act still in place? How will it roll out in the future? And what can the citizens do about this? So, yeah, currently the Emergencies Act still exists. And again, it is there in case of severe emergency, which I personally am not convinced that the convoy was, but I, I look forward to see the findings of the inquiry. Uh, it was revoked once the emergency was declared over, so it's no longer, Canada is no longer under a state of emergency. 
Um, some of the broader implications for democracy that I think that this has is that it sets a dangerous precedent. When you're lying about why you're using such sweeping powers, it basically is a way for you to quash political dissidents, which some would argue is exactly what Trudeau did when he invoked the Emergencies Act. I think it's very, very troubling to see, um, to see lies used to justify this excessive use of government overreach and things like that. As for how uh, people can respond to it, I think the real way is, you know, consuming media like this, learning about it, engaging with it, and ultimately, if you're not satisfied, showing it at the ballot box. I think that's honestly the only way to protect democracy. Thank you so much. I think uh, that really, that really was a great explanation of a complex issue in simple terms. All right, everybody, that wraps up episode one of Wake Up Call. Thank you all so much for tuning in um, on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever you're using. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank Joshua Deslandes for coming on and talking to us about abortion, giving us his views, and participating in, a, in what I thought was a great discussion. That's what we're all about here at Wake Up Call. Yeah, uh, and we just want to urge you to start a discussion in the comments if you have any ideas or if you disagree with us. Also, make sure to follow us on our social media on Instagram at the Wake Up Call podcast, also on our YouTube, and um, make sure to listen to the podcast. We'll be together with you very soon, once again, with a new episode. Thank you for listening.